Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back.
Lord, we do. We come before your throne, Lord, and we offer a blessing and, and worship to you. Uh, God, you alone uh, provide us with, uh, as the song said, the living waters that we can have this eternal life. And we know that, that uh, Lord, that you are working in our hearts and lives today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will bless our time together. Uh, be with those uh, who are joining us online or, or at home. And Father, I just pray that and all that we say and do as we gather together, may we bring honor and glory to you. Uh, it is in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. We're getting close to talking about the Exodus, and it's like, whoosh. <laughs> hey, good morning. <laughs> We're glad you're here this morning at uh, Gages Lake Bible Church on the uh, most drab Sunday because last week everything was up here and as we take it all down everything's like oh it's plain again. <laughs> so I tried to wear a red shirt so you know you can at least have a little color up here. Uh, no we had a great time uh, last week uh, at Vacation Bible School and we averaged right around 40 to 42 uh, each night. Uh, that was with a number of kids plus our workers. Uh, it was a great time. Uh, that was 
Uh, I heard great things from our families that came. They were so excited. Kids were uh, waiting at their doors to come back each night. And so uh, we had a, a good turnout. Uh, the rain came a couple of nights, but we were able to pivot a little bit. And uh, Andy was able to survive games in the fellowship hall. Uh, we had Fred and Ed up here at some point teaching Bible lessons. I don't know which one's Fred, which one's Ed, uh, but they did a great job. And then we had uh, some goofy guys doing some skits, uh, stepping on bugs and stuff, and it was all kinds of fun. Uh, but it was great. Um, I know my kids have been playing with their science experiments, and the crafts were uh, fantastic. And I'm leaving out some of the snacks. All the snacks were great. And so a special thank you to all of those who helped uh, make that a success, whether it be setting up decorations or cutting out things or wandering with kids to make sure that they didn't go into the street. We didn't have any go into the street. Uh, it was a great time. Special thank you to uh, Cheyenne for leading that uh, as she does. And so uh, great, great VBS. <laughs> And, and now it's summertime, so uh, we're in the, the, the weeks of summer, and just a couple of announcements for us as we move through these few months. Uh, uh, today, there is a baptism service uh, right at the end of this service, so uh, the, basically it will be uh, at the end of this service, we're actually taking communion together, and then we'll transition to a baptism, and I invite you to stay and support these who are uh, being baptized, and uh, what a great opportunity for us to participate in two ordinances <laughs> that God established, you know, communion and baptism today. So, uh, so that's today. Uh, and then as we go through the month, there's going to be uh, not the normal routines of, you know, like uh, the men's Saturday morning thing or the ladies, thing, because it's summer and people are traveling and different things. And so uh, please... Uh, Connect with one another outside of here. Uh, we would love to hear about people joining together. We have a few times during the summer where we'd like to all join together, uh, but at least, you know, they're not official, like small groups or things like that. So stay connected with our church as much as you can. Uh, we would love to keep you connected. Uh, I wanted to announce the board meeting is two weeks from today, so not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. So board, you can plan to be here for that. Uh, next Sunday is... What is next Sunday? It's Father's Day. Oh, yeah, right. Ooh, Father's Day. And all the dads are like, yay, a new wallet. <laughs> you know, I've been asking for a wallet for like six years, and I haven't gotten one yet. So, uh, But Father's Day is next Sunday, and so I invite you to come and be a part of that. We'll have a special gift for all of our fathers and men uh, who are here next Sunday. So we also have a, a special speaker next Sunday. Um, we're continuing through Exodus, and uh, Andrew Metzger is going to be bringing the message next week, and so uh, my wife and I will be out of town uh, to visit some of her family, so uh, if you could uh, make plans to be a part of that. He's continuing in Exodus. Uh, I think he's got a great um, sermon title, working sermon title. <laughs> he, he's, he, we're figuring it out, so it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun uh, next Sunday for Father's Day, so there you go. Uh, thinking of other announcements, I don't think there's any. Uh, uh, prayer service today at 4. So if you are wanting to join us in prayer, uh, we're having a prayer service today at 4 uh, for those who are here. Um, there was something that was on my mind. Oh, July, the month of July, we have a sermon series called uh, Little Stories, Big Impact. So uh, each, each week we're breaking from Exodus and we'll go into... Uh, a couple of little smaller um, uh, Bible stories, but how they still make a big impact on our our living. I think we've got one that's going to be on Esther, one that's going to be on Jonah, one that's going to be on Ruth. Uh, we've got Stephen. So there's uh, the month of July is going to have a break from our Exodus series. It's also going to have our kids stay in the service with us uh, because we love it. And you get, you're like, yeah, you get to stand up there while I have to deal with my squirrely children. Uh, I get it. So, uh, but we like to do that a few uh, during this time of the year because it gives a chance for the family to worship together. It gives you as a parent to a chance to uh, help your kid understand what church is about. Uh, that we're not here just to play games, but we're here to learn about Christ and uh, learn uh, how to grow in our faith. So, uh, so make plans to be a part of that in the month of July. Uh, we have a few uh, speakers lined up for that as well. So. 
uh, that's, that's what's coming up. I think that's it. So, all right, worship team, you guys can, it's getting bigger every time. Like, I feel like next week we're going to have 10 people, and the week after that, 15 people. And it's like, I have the whole church up here singing to, to, to know. But no, I'm thankful for those who are joining us for our worship team. So let's stand together, and uh, we're going to sing a hymn. Uh, it's a hymn. There's gospel power song. in the blood. There's power in the blood. After we, we sing, you can remain standing for our scripture reading. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. And if you would, you can open your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter number 12. And our scripture reading this morning will be verses 1 through 13. I'll be reading from the ESV. Exodus 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if a household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses on which they eat. 
They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, with your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And, all, and on all gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plagues will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts now as we study your word together. Uh, Lord, encourage us, Lord, but also challenge us to grow and to walk in a, uh, a deeper way. We love you, and we praise you today. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And I know some of you are thinking, wait, didn't we read this before? <laughs> I mean, it sounds familiar to us. Um, I, I remember hearing it last week, and if you are not mistaken, you read it the week before. I promise you, Andrew's not reading it next week. Actually, you probably should. That would be fun. <laughs> anyway. No, this morning, we're actually entering the third week in this passage uh, of Exodus chapter 12. And I know you might be thinking, oh, <laughs> we got stuck. Like, what happened here? Uh, there's so much that, that I believe is important. Uh, for us as we go through this book together. Uh, of course, remember our series is called Shadows of Jesus Christ, and, and we're studying this Old Testament book, but we're looking at it with, with New Testament glasses, and we want to see, you know, how do things point to Jesus? Uh, that the hero of the story, the hero of Exodus is not Moses, the hero of Exodus is not Israel uh, or anyone else, that it's God and God alone. And specifically, it's pointing us to Jesus Christ, that, he want, that God wants us to know him, he wants us to worship him, as John says, in spirit and in truth, and he wants us to know who his son is. And so we've s sort of slowed down, you could say, it's been a month, right? We've slowed down here, and we've kind of come to this, this screeching halt. Because this really is the, the climax of the first part of the Exodus, isn't it? Like, this is the moment that we've been leading up to throughout these first 11 chapters. We've established who Israel was. We've established who Egypt was. We entered Moses' time, and, and, and we've seen all of these different plagues. And God has demonstrated over and over and over again that he alone is the true God and that there's no one that's going to stand before him. And we've seen this phrase over and over again that you may know, that Egypt may know, that Pharaoh may know, that, that Israel may know, that you and I may know who is the Lord. And so now we're here in this, this third week in this passage, and, and the New Testament events, as you noticed the last couple of weeks, that kind of coincide with this first Passover. I had several people actually tell me last week that, man, you should have done this on Easter, and to which I said, yes, I should have, but we, weren't, we were at the plague of frogs at Easter, and I don't really think frogs fit with bunnies and, and chocolate, and, you know, anyway, well, here we are, chocolate, frog, like, no, 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 here we are, and honestly, listen, shouldn't, I'm going to make this little cop-out statement, right, shouldn't we celebrate Easter throughout the year? Should I say it again? Should we celebrate Easter throughout the year? Yes. yes. I mean, Jesus is alive, right? right? I mean, when I mention Easter, okay, I'm not referring to the bunny or the egg. Now, however you guys do the bunny, we, we do the Easter egg. We don't really do the Easter bunny thing, but we do the Easter eggs and the chocolates. But, but really, the focus of Easter is what? The crucifixion and subsequent resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like, that's why we celebrate. And I'm not sure if you figured it out or not. But if you've ever studied this, the, actually the two calendars that we have, like we, we have a Gregorian calendar and the Jews have their own calendar, the, the Passover and Easter don't always coincide. Uh, you ever get confused on how Easter falls? Like, like, it's like they just pull it out of a hat. Like, oh yeah, this one's a great one. No, there's actually a whole like system uh, to figure it out. Does anybody know the system? A couple of people. Here, the, I'll give it to you, so that way you can know when Easter is forever and ever, okay? The, 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 the calendar is this. It's the first Sunday 
after the first full moon, after the vernal equinox. It sounds like a government put it together. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's anywhere from the end of March to the middle of April. Uh, this year it was like April 17th. Um, and, and that's what it is. So the first vernal equinox is like March 21st or 20th. Anyway, whenever that happens, and there's a full moon after that, and then the Sunday after that. What? Well, we have a Gregorian calendar, and we get convinced. The Jews have their own calendar, the Jewish calendar. Actually, we'll see it today, uh, mentioned here at the beginning. But they, they don't exactly line up the same. The last time they actually did was actually last year, 2021. But the Jewish calendar actually has its beginnings here in Exodus chapter 12. A few things about the Jewish calendar. It has 12 months, and each month uh, alternates between 30 days and 29 days. And so as a result, every few years, you know how every few years we add a, a day, every few years for the Jews, they add an entire month. So imagine not just having a leap day, having a leap month. Like, boy, I'd like to take that whole month off, right? Like, they do it every few years. And so that, that kind of lines things back up. So this morning, I want to give this third and final message, if you will, from this passage. And as some of you are thinking, are we ever going to move on? We will. We are. But I really felt led to, to kind of dig into this section because I feel like that this, as I said, was the climax of the story. And what we've been doing is pulling back layers and seeing what is God trying to show us. Two weeks ago, we talked about the problem of Passover. That was that, that Israel was just as sinful as Egypt was, and Israel needs deliverance in the same way. We saw that in verse 13, where it says, this will be a sign for you. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, so that no plague will befall you to destroy you. Israel needs God to give them a rescue out from under the wrath that they deserve. And then last week, we, we looked at the second point, which was the provision of the Passover. And we focused a lot on the lamb itself, uh, the Passover lamb, the blood that was shed. In order for the destroyer to, to pass over the home, they had to put the blood on the doorposts. That was, there was this, this innocent death, if you will, for the guilty. So this morning, our third and final point uh, I titled it The Power of the Passover, because what is the result of this? What did Israel receive because of it? And what do we receive subsequently because of the death of our Passover lamb, Jesus Christ? Okay, three short things today uh, as we go through this. The first thing that I noticed that Israel received was a new beginning. A new beginning. Look with me at verse number one. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Right here at the beginning, we've read this several times, it says that God gives them a new beginning. This is going to be their, their new year, if you will, and that this is going to be the first month of their new year. The Jewish calendar starts right here, and their first month is called Nisan, not the car, okay? Nisan means first fruits. Uh, and for them, it signified for the Jews that this was the first month of spring. Okay? Uh, and, and this is how the Jewish calendar would come about. But what does this mean to have a, a new beginning for the Israelites? Well, let's put ourselves in the Israelites' position. This means for the first time in 400 years, the Jews were going to be able to make time, if you will, according to, to God's calendar. Like, like, let's think about this. They had been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. Slavery is not something that you measure time by. It doesn't give you time off. Like, like okay, we worked Monday through Friday. It's the weekend, and now we get the time off. No, no. Okay, well, we saved it. We worked really hard for several months, and my family's going on vacation now, so here we go. No. Oh, we get, you know, it's Christmas. They wouldn't have Christmas. Anyway, it's, it's, it's Easter, or it's, it's, it's Labor Day. For the, for the slaves, every day was Labor Day. Or whatever Casimir Pulaski Day is. I'm sorry, I'm not from up here. No, this is slavery. 
This is something that means that each day just sort of bleeds into the next day. And each week bleeds into the next week and into the next month and into the next year, into decades and centuries. It's one giant blur that has no end. Don't worry, it's just the pump for the baptism. It's keeping it warm. We could turn it off, but it's fine. This was a new beginning for them. Until, listen, they, everything is kind of just blended together until God comes along and says, listen, I'm going to start something new. You're going to now mark time in a brand new way. This is the end of your former life as you know it. This is the beginning of a brand new system for you. Now skip down, if you will, to verse 3. It says, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, you'll take the lamb. And if you skip down to verse 6, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Moses calls Israel here, or God, excuse me, through Moses calls Israel this congregation, okay? And as a matter of fact, this is the first time it's mentioned. If you go back into Genesis, all the way back to Genesis 1, and you read all the way through to Exodus 12, this is what you'll find. The people of Israel, before this point, are referred to as the children of Israel, the sons of Israel, Israel, Hebrews. This is the first time in Scripture where they're actually called a congregation. That is, they're given this, this identity, if you will, of a community, a new community. And so their calendar and their identity go together. As a matter of fact, we still live this way. Like if you looked at your, if we were able to lay out your calendar, and if you looked at my calendar, or perhaps we looked at one of the calendars of different cultures, what we would find is there are different celebrations. Like, like, like maybe, maybe you're Jewish and you celebrate Yom Kippur. Maybe you're from Arab nations and you celebrate Ramadan. Maybe there's a Christmas in yours. Like much of what is on your calendar tells you something, tells us something about your identity. Kazimir Pulaski Day tells me you're from Illinois and apparently Polish. Okay, what God is doing here with Israel is he's, he's giving them this new beginning, this new identity, this, this new sense of time. And he's telling them, listen, you're not going to just be known by your ethnicity. You're not just going to be known by Hebrews. You're not going to be known by your ancestry, like as sons of Israel. You're going to be known now by this experience, this, this community, this congregation. As a matter of fact, there's not a single event uh, beyond this point or before this point that afterwards in the scriptures is mentioned more often than this night when God passed over the Egyptians. Like this is the one, this is the common experience that they're all going into. You've shared a common experience and now you have a common direction. You're on your way out of Egypt. You're going to be delivered in the same way. This is what's going to shape you together. This is what's going to bring this, this unity to your group. Do I need to make the connection for us? Like we have a shared common experience and that's the cross. And that we join together because we experience the same salvation. Whether we're Jews or Greeks or male or female, slave or free, it doesn't matter. We experience salvation. There's a congregation. There's a community that we have. Look at verse 4. God is already building the unity here. Look at verse 4. It says, And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. We mentioned it last week, but I wanted to bring back here that each family was told, listen, on day 10, go get a lamb for your family. And the point is that you're going to have to eat the entire lamb. There's going to be nothing left. And that means that, that if I'm a, a, a young husband and I have my wife and, and we, you know, we can't eat an entire lamb, uh, what we would do is we would go and find a neighbor, a family friend, or, or another person, another couple next door, and we would join in with them, okay? It's not a uh, bring your own lamb party. It was we share 
together in this lamb eating together. Listen, this is what God does. This is a new community that God is forming. That God comes and he gives people now this, this fresh start, this new beginning. It's a, it's a new identity and we're a new community together. This is not a witness protection program, okay, where you get a new identity and you go and you... No, no, no. Like this, you're still you, but now your identity is what Paul says is in Jesus Christ. I mean, how many of us long for this? I, I wish I could have a start over button. I, I wish that I wasn't defined by something in my past. I don't, I don't want to be known for a conversation that I had 10 years ago. I don't want to be known by this text that I sent out and I regret. I want to start over. I want something new. See, we live in a culture today where that's not possible. There, there's no forgiveness in culture. I, I heard this story uh, once. A boy had, had gossiped and had damaged a relationship and he went to the wise man of the village and he said uh what do i do i want to make this right and the wise man said here take this bag of feathers apparently he had a bag of feathers he said take this bag of feathers here and i want you to go through the village and i want you to scatter the feathers out everywhere you go and so he does he goes and he scatters the feathers everywhere and he comes back and he goes to the old man and he says okay i've done that now the old man says now go back and i want you to pick up every single feather pick them all up of course, you can't do that, right? The old man said, so it is, my son. You can't undo what you've done. Like, that, that might be helpful and sort of true, right? You can't put the toothpaste back into the toothpaste tube. But don't we all long for that? Like, don't we want to know that there, there can be a change? There can be something that I'm not defined by this anymore? I mean, I, I might not be able to pick up all the feathers, but the point of what the Bible teaches us is that God picks up the feathers, that God gives you a fresh start, and that he gives each one of us a fresh start if we simply believe. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Listen, there's forgiveness. There's this, this newness that we have. And as Christians, those of us who are in Christ, God has, has rescued us from the slavery of our past. And we've kind of come out from under bondage to Satan. And we, we don't have to be defined by that anymore. We've now been set free. No, Christianity doesn't erase your past. But what Christianity says is this is not how you are defined. You are now part of a new beginning, a new identity, and a new community. And if that is true, then, 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 and that's what God does, then that's why people, if you will, who come to, come to faith later in life, they say things like, I wish it wouldn't have taken me so long. Or, or they, they, they actually mark time differently. And maybe you've heard this in conversations. That was before I was saved. That's who I was. Like, like I'm now a new person. They have a new beginning. The second thing that the Israelites have is a new freedom. Look with me, if you will, in verse number 11. A new freedom. Verse 11, it says, In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. So we know the story. They were to take the lamb, they were to keep it for a few days, and then they were to slaughter the lamb on the 14th day. And then the Bible says they were to drain the blood of the lamb and they were to put the blood on the doorpost, the two doorposts, and then across the top. And then it says they were to take the lamb and they were to roast it. Now, I'm a food person and I'm hearing this going, ooh, that sounds good, right? Boiled lamb, ugh. I like hot dogs roasted, okay? I'm not a boiled hot dog fan. Is anybody in the same camp as me? Like, okay, thank you. Those that make him black on the outside. Yeah, sorry, I'm digressing. They were supposed to eat the lamb. But notice what it says, that they were actually supposed to dress. It says you eat it with your belt fastened. I think the King James says that they were to gird up their loins. 
uh, the idea was that they wore robes and that they would take them and they would gather them up and they would take a belt and tie their robes up to allow them to move quickly. Put your shoes on, right? Grab your staff, start up the car, get it warmed up, open the garage, and then eat your lamb in haste. Get your Happy Meal, scarf it down. Why? We're leaving. This is the day that we're leaving. We're, we're, we're like, we're, this is happening. We're on our way out. Now, listen. In order to do that, you know what you had to believe? You know what the Israelites had to believe? That they were really leaving. Like, we look at this and go, well, sure, yeah. I mean, we've been reading up to this point. This is it. I mean, it's, the book is called Exodus. It means to leave. Yeah. But for the Israelites, it's been 400 years of the same thing. 400 years of slavery. It's all they've known. It's all their parents have known. It's all their grandparents have known. Listen, let, let, let's say that we have this, this horrible past of, of ownership slavery here in America, that, that America, African Americans come and we enslave them. Now, imagine going to one of those slaves, and, after you, and, and they've only known this for 200 years, and someone says, today is the day you're setting yourself free. Like, how much faith would it take for someone to believe that that was actually going to happen? That you're actually going to be free. The Israelites for 400, America hasn't even existed for that long. Your ancestors, their ancestors, their ancestors, all they've ever known is this life of slavery. But today's the day. Put your shoes on. Get ready. We're going out. Freedom starts today. But wait, Mo Moses, listen. Like, I get it. Man, that would be great. But it's not going to happen. Egypt's my home. Like, it's shaped who I am. And it's all I've ever known. And this is what happens when we leave Egypt. The Israelites leave Egypt and they go out into the wilderness. And what you begin to see is that Egypt has not left the Israelites. What you're going to see is in a few chapters is they're going to start grumbling they're going to start complaining. Why? I missed it. I want to go back. I, I, that was familiar to me. I want to go back to Egypt. And they start talking about Egypt in these beautiful terms. Oh, we had this. Oh, we had that. Do you see the parallel? Like, isn't this how so many Christians behave and think? Like, we would rather trust in the bondage that we can see than in the God that we can't see. We want to go back to the familiar, that old lifestyle, that old slavery. Oh, man, I hate that that happened, but, but it's familiar to me. It's easy to go back to. I, I know my way around Egypt. I know how to, to do that sort of thing. I know my way around my sin. I mean, I don't want it. It feels comfortable. Israel's getting a new freedom. But the people obeyed. Skip down to verse 28. I know I'm getting into another person's section, but verse 28 says, Then the people of Israel went and did so. As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. They obeyed. Even though it's been 400 years, they still had enough gumption to say, okay, Moses, okay, God, you've commanded me, I will obey. I can start to dream about their future. I'm starting to see this new light. Maybe this really is, okay, let's do it. I have a new freedom. However, there is something interesting about this freedom. It, it's freedom as long as they are willing to obey God. It's freedom as long as they're able to leave Pharaoh and now submit to God. God's not saying, listen, I'm bringing you out of Egypt to do your own thing. 
You define what is reality now. No. What he's saying is, I'm freeing you so that you may serve me. So that you will worship me. So that you are now my worshipers. And I want you to worship me as the Lord. That's the point. That's what we are here for. It's not for ourselves. It's to worship God. Look, with verse, look at me at verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. See, God says, listen, I'm eliminating and I've eliminated all these Egyptian gods. All these ones. Like, like Egyptian, Egypt's going to get to the end of this and they're going to be like, our gods are worthless. Our, our gods mean nothing to us. They don't work for us anymore. Like, why, why would anyone worship another god? Like, why would the Egyptians worship another god? We've seen all these different Egyptian gods as we've done the plagues, the ones of fertility or the ones of crops or the ones of life or the ones of health and medicine, all these like false gods. Gods of protection, gods of, of, of direction. And they're eliminated. And if you really studied Egypt, you would see that all of their worship centered around this idea of, of their life. I want to have life and I want to uh, have sort of some control on, on having children or, or I don't want to get old and die. Then the destroyer comes and shows that even their gods of life are powerless. They're decimated. Their religion is now useless. Their gods are gone. This is the end, if you will, of that kind of worship. For you and I this morning, listen, everything that we run to, everything that we go to that is not God, but it's all about giving us life. It's all about making life more abundant. It's about escaping death. And if I could say this, in America, we have this worship of youth. I want lasting youth. I want to stay as young as possible for as long as possible. I want health. I want happiness. I want to avoid diseases. I want to avoid death. And so what do we do? We go to these gods in order to give us life. But listen, if you're going to go to those gods, you still have to uh, solve the problem of death. Like, there's no eternal youth. My wife and kids, we, we actually went to Florida a number of years ago in uh, St. Saint Augustine, Florida. And you know what we found? The fountain of youth. It's this little mud hole. And we drank from it. It was disgusting. It tasted like minerals, which of course, duh. And we drank it. I'm younger today than I was seven years ago. My back's not hurting at all. Listen, well, the fountain of youth, right? But that's, isn't that what we do in America? We want to stay young. I don't want to grow old. Because growing old means I'm going to die. And God is showing through this destroyer coming and decimating life that we're looking in the wrong places. Listen, God alone holds the keys of life and death. Look at what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2. He says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death, notice, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You see what the writer of Hebrews is saying there? He's saying that slavery is the, a fear of death. How many people in the last year and a half have been enslaved to the God of death? I'm so fearful. What might happen to me? I'm not sure what to do. How can I prevent it? Do I get the shot? Do I not get the shot? Like how long do I, pro how can I prolong my life? 
Or maybe we set them up as gods and goddesses. Oh, we don't call them that. We call them vaccines. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I, I've been vaccinated. Like, there's nothing wrong with this, but it's not my God. I look to medicine and doctors. I look to kale and CrossFit. I look to success and surgery to keep me young and healthy because that's going to ward death off. Listen, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but we need to remember that God is the one who's in control. God is the one who's established your number of days. See, God's telling Israel, I want you to be free from those false gods. I want you to follow after me. Jesus says, come, follow me. I'm the one who took on flesh. I'm the one who's conquered death. And you know what now? You have nothing to fear. You don't have to be enslaved to that anymore. This is a new freedom. Have you gotten to that place? I pray that we get to the place where we can say, I'm not afraid of death. That's a new freedom. The last one. They have a new beginning. They have a new freedom. Thirdly, they have a new forgiveness. Look with me, verse number 7. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. We know the story. They were to take the blood and they were to put it on the two sides of the door and then across the top. And now in verse 13, it says that God says, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. We talked about this last week, but I want to reiterate something here. God is not asking them to put blood on the door because he can't see in the dark and he's confused on which house he needs to go to. I need directions. All right, well, uh, okay, that's fine. That was good. No, no, no. Notice verse 13. It says, the blood shall be a sign for you. Not for God, for you. That this blood that's shed is this tangible, visceral reminder that life comes through death. That they're going to look at this and they're going to realize, I lived tonight because something died and that blood is on that door. I'm rescued by the blood. We just sang the song, there's power in the blood. The blood is simply a sign that sin has been dealt with, that sin has been taken care of, and they needed to know that they were forgiven. And how do they know that they're forgiven? The blood has been shed. So Christian, what do you do? Well, we look to the cross. We, we look to the shed blood of our Passover lamb. Jesus Christ. And I say, can my sins be forgiven? Can I ever come out from under this terrible thing uh, that I've done? Can I ever have a new start? Can I ever get out from under this? Can I really start over? The answer is yes. It is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. We celebrate the, the resurrection and of course, it's a celebration, right, of new beginnings and new life. And everyone dressed in pastels, like it's like a pastel factory blew up. And we're, it's just great. It's yay. Listen, Christ's resurrection was a new beginning for himself. It was a new beginning for the disciples. It was a new beginning for the church. It was a new beginning for the world. And see, listen, it's a new beginning for you and for me. See, Romans tells us about this. Romans tells us about our belief in Jesus, that we're no longer, if you will, slaves to sin, that we're out from under the bondage of sin. We're now considered slaves of righteousness. We now serve God. Let me show you a few verses from Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We're getting ready to celebrate someone taking that step of baptism. Someone who is saying, I have chosen Christ and he is in me and I want to walk in him. I want to walk in newness of life. Verse 6 and 7, Romans 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Do you see that? Verse 17 and 18. Thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you are committed And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Listen, every year we hear the story of Easter. We hear the story of Christ's resurrection over and over, time and time again. We hear the message about Jesus. We hear the message about the cross. We hear it at Easter. Sometimes we hear it at Christmas. We hear about it. We sing about it all the time. Do you know why? The Passover would be celebrated every year for centuries. And it was done for them to remember what God had done for them. Do you know why we need to hear the story of Jesus and the cross over and over and over again? Because how many of us blew it this week? How many of us sinned this week? How many of us sinned today? Even those of us who claim the name of Jesus Christ, how many of us didn't live a perfectly consistent life? How many of us still sin? This is why we need to hear the story. This is why we need to come back again and again. Because we fall into these sin patterns. And and we fall back into regretting. We fall back into, boy, I wish I could go back to that. And we need to be reminded, listen, you have a new beginning. You have a new freedom. You have a new forgiveness. Christ is our Passover lamb. And he offered himself up for us. As a matter of fact, by rising from the dead, unlike the Passover lamb, which did not rise from the dead, Christ's resurrection from the dead confirms to us that everything he said was true, and you must believe it. It also confirms for us that God vindicated Jesus and accepted him as the final sacrifice. Now there doesn't have to be a sacrifice for sin again. You can't pay for your sins. Only Jesus can. And listen, when God comes back, one of two things will be true. Either you have taken shelter under the blood of Jesus. And you have said, Jesus, you have covered my sins. You have have, uh, uh, taken my sin. And you will be saved. But when the Lord comes back, and that's not you, you will spend eternity paying for your sins. Listen, there's only two choices. What you're being offered is a new beginning, a reset, a new freedom. Freedom out from under the bondage of sin and freedom to serve our God and Savior. And you've been given a new forgiveness. That's hard for me to imagine anyone that will look at that and say, I'll pass. I I don't want a new beginning. I, I don't want freedom. I don't want to be forgiven. Israel here, it says that they, verse 28 again, that they went and did so. That they took shelter under the blood of the Lamb. And for us this morning, it is saying this, Jesus Christ, you have paid for my sins. And now today, it's the first new month. My calendar starts over. I was this, now I'm a new creature. That can be you today. Let's pray. 
God, this morning, Lord, you are a holy, holy God. You have given us life and breath. God, today we need you. We need to be reminded, Lord, that you alone have offered us the true gift of salvation. That your son, Jesus Christ's blood was shed for our, on our behalf. And God, I pray that if there's one here that's hearing this message that does not know, if they've, they have not nailed down this with 100% certainty, I pray that they will reach out to someone today, that, that your Holy Spirit would convict them and, and just direct them to seek out someone to receive the, the help that they need to understand more. For those of us who are in Christ, Lord, I know that many of us, perhaps all of us, have, have blown it this week. Help us to remember that your son, help us to remember that we have forgiveness. That we don't have to trust in the gods of this world. We don't have to fear death. Because ultimately we serve the one who defeated death. And the one who has given us eternal life. We love you. And we praise you today. It is in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the elders, if you would, uh, to come forward. And uh, Ken, too. We're going to enter into a time of communion, a time of remembrance. I'm going to move down. Is this still on? In our church, every month we take a few moments to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Uh, we participate in what we call the Lord's Supper, a uh, time of communion. In our church, we believe that these are crackers and it's grape juice, uh, and that's what they are. But they are simply symbolic of Jesus' broken body and his shed blood. And that those of us who are believers in Christ do this to remember him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes, Lord, what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We do this to remember him. We're returning to our normal pre-COVID uh, communion. If you are feeling more comfortable, we do have some individual supplies out there uh, for those that would like it, but uh, we're going to go ahead with the, the bread.
The Bible says that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of him. I heard it shared once that if you looked at the door of the home and you had blood on the left and blood on the right and blood on the top, that naturally as they put the blood on the top, there would be blood on the bottom and it would create the picture of a cross uh, because the cross, the shed blood of Jesus, when we read in Hebrews, we find that the blood of animals couldn't save. It couldn't cleanse their conscience. Only the blood of Jesus. And so we take this cup of juice to remind ourselves of the shed blood of Jesus. says in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes in remembrance of him the Bible tells us that Jesus when he was after he rose, that he was on his way uh, back to heaven, and he talked about how they were to do things. One of them we just partake of. The other one is found in Matthew chapter 28, where he tells his disciples to go and make disciples of other people, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in Romans chapter 6, Paul goes into talking about that baptism. We just read uh, the verses from it, and uh, I want to go back to it. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And we celebrate those who make that choice to be baptized into Jesus Christ 
Baptism doesn't save us. It is simply an obedience to what Christ has told us to do. And it is a public demonstration, a public proclamation for someone choosing to walk with Jesus Christ. And so those that would like to go get ready for that can. And we're going to sing a few songs. And I'm going to slip to the back and then uh, we'll celebrate those who have been back. She's number two, uh, but the first girl. And uh, just me. And Addie, has, uh, she came up to me probably a month or so ago and said, I want to get baptized. And so, Addie, why do you want to get baptized today? I've decided to get baptized today because I want to tell everyone that I am a Christian. I've been a Christian my whole life, and I've loved loving Jesus. Through conversations and Bible classes, I've been influenced by, uh, to get baptized by my family, Pastor Jay, my teacher, Ms. Farish, uh, and my mentor and former teacher, Mrs. Szczynski. I want to tell everyone that I'm a Christian, that I love Jesus, 
and that he will save me from all my sins. I believe that getting baptized today is my visible sign of faith. Amen. All right, you can sit down. Patty has chosen to take this step in her faith, and uh, we count it a privilege to be able to baptize those. And so, Addie, as my little sister in Christ, I'd like to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. By the glory of the Father, even to you shall walk. at this time to sing the song I have decided to follow Jesus and uh, we're going to sing that song together and uh, we're going to continue to celebrate those who have received Christ. be closed uh, in prayer and then after we close in the back we have some uh, cake and celebration of Addie uh, and so we invite you to join us back there as we can congratulate her on her our step of faith and as uh, we encourage her and can I challenge you as a church to continue to lift her up in prayer and support and uh, let's join as a community and let's see these young people continue to walk with Christ uh, let's be closed in prayer father we thank you Lord, we thank you for uh, your gift of eternal life, of salvation. And Lord, we thank you that we are able to see uh, young people, Lord, just make a step to say, I want to follow you with my life. Uh, Lord, Jude says that there is no greater joy than to see our children walking in truth. And Lord, I thank you so much for the Leach family. And I, I, I pray that you would empower their, your spirit within them as they continue to train uh, Addie to walk. And I, I pray that you would challenge us as a church, as a community, family, friends, those who have joined us today, close personal people in Addie's life. And I pray that, that we would continue to see uh, your spirit doing great and mighty things in her life, as well as ours, as we seek to help her. Uh, we love you so much, and we praise you today. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said together, amen. 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 You are dismissed.